name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our gospel passage this morning concludes with these words. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. These words are written and read again and again from generation to generation that we, you and I might come to believe. And believe in terms, in the terms of the gospel is to put our trust in, to choose to rely upon Jesus Christ, the anointed one, the son of God. Every year on the Sunday after Easter, churches that use the Revised Common Lectionary, many of the mainline churches, turn together to the 20th chapter of John's Gospel and read the account of the disciples' encounter with the risen Christ. This story of encounter with the risen Christ can provide us some clues, some hints to the obstacles and the opportunities of believing, of living as a resurrection people. We read, when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, locked for fear of the Jews. The disciples, it seems, were afraid that rather than having life in his name, being associated with Jesus might bring them death. And so they locked the doors. trying to keep everyone out, to keep safe. And yet, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Despite their fear, their lack of belief, their lack of trust, or perhaps because of their fear, and their lack of trust, the risen Christ pursues the disciples. He shows them his hands and his side. They see the wounds are real. The glorious body of the risen Christ carries the wounds. Now, we don't much like wounds. We don't like seeing them. We certainly don't like having them. We shield ourselves from wounds. But Jesus shows them the wounds to let them know that the wounds are not the end. In the first letter of Peter, we read, by his great mercy, he hath given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. A living hope, a sense of future, a sense that the wounds are not the end. There is life 
even in and through and after the wounding. And with that hard truth, for them, for us, Jesus offers them peace. But Thomas wasn't there. This Thomas who, when the disciples were on their way to Bethany with Jesus to the grave of Lazarus, and people were saying, it's dangerous. Thomas was the one who said, let us also go that we may die with him. Perhaps Thomas wasn't there because he wasn't afraid to die. Perhaps Thomas was ready to go it alone, trusting that he had what it took to face death because of Jesus. But perhaps Thomas needed to see the wounds, how terrible they were. When I was young, reading the lives of the saints, I imagined myself becoming a martyr. Then everyone would look up to me. Big, grandiose ideas. But the reality is a sliver in my finger or a sprained ankle sent me weeping and concerned for my very well-being. Now, perhaps Thomas was a tough guy with a high pain threshold ready to face a martyr's death under his own strength. Perhaps Thomas needed to see those horrible, loving, divine wounds so that he would put his trust not in his own ability, but that he would believe, put his trust in the risen Christ who said to him, do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered, my Lord and my God. The first profession in the New Testament that Jesus was divine. My Lord and my God. These are words that I instinctu instinctually echo when I am feeling vulnerable, unsure of myself, uncertain that I have what it takes to face the challenges ahead. It's not infrequent that it happens while I'm walking the dog in the morning, thinking about all the challenges in front of me feeling overwhelmed, and suddenly out of my mouth comes my Lord and my God. You see, Jesus offers not just his peace, but his spirit upon his followers. A spirit that animates us, that brings us to life. Jesus' wounds are not something to be erased or forgotten. Rather, in the light of his resurrection, these wounds give us hope. Richard Rohr, a Franciscan priest, writes this. The crucified Jesus offers at a largely unconscious level, a very compassionate meaning system for history. Without such cosmic meaning and soul significance, the agonies and tragedies of Earth feel like Shakespeare's sound and fury signifying nothing. Rohr goes on to say, if all our crucifixions are leading to some possible resurrection, 
and are not dead in tragedies. This changes everything. If God is somehow participating in the suffering of humans and creation, instead of just passively tolerating it and observing it from afar, that also changes everything. Perhaps today, the risen and wounded one the one who was wounded for our transgressions is calling us into a deeper and hope-filled trust. A trust that is lived out with great compassion for ourselves, for one another, and for all those who live with deep wounds. This is the good news of the resurrection, that we can face the troubles, the wounds, with faith, with hope, and with love. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.